And it's 5.15 plus here at WBAI in New York. And now, a very hasty introduction to tonight's Gene Shepard program, which is going to answer, at least in uh, Shepard's own words, why he left his radio career after 20-some-odd uh, years at WOR. Now, there was uh, apparently newspaper articles that the WOR was changing radically its uh, format in 1977 in March. And uh, sweeping out such shows as the Bob and Ray Afternoon Drive Time and uh, a whole lot of other things. Shepard tells it somewhat differently. Uh, one interesting note on this program from March 23rd of 1977. Sometime near the very end of the show... It seems they pushed back the starting time by five minutes so they could squeeze in even more commercials. And I have clipped out most of the nine-minute straight block of commercials in the middle to try to get uh, get done in time. Will we make it? I doubt it, but uh, let's go. Gene Shepard on why he's leaving radio. This episode from March 23rd, 1977. WR News Time, 9-10. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Not there, right? <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, uh, listen, uh, before we get underway here, I have to uh, uh, I have to apologize that I cannot answer uh, all the letters that have come in and uh, et cetera about uh, uh, leaving the uh, show that we've been doing for some years. And I want to thank all of you, but I have to explain to you very much why this is occurring. Uh, I think many people are under the uh, misapprehension that, uh, you know, it's the station and so on. It's not true. As a matter of fact, for well over, oh, I'd say roughly two years now, uh, I have been planning to move into other areas, and, in fact, the plans to leave here were made uh, roughly six months ago. And the fact that there were other things happening on the station simultaneously really had nothing to do with my move, and it was purely on my my evolution, etc. And the reason that this is so, uh, some of you know, I guess most of you probably know this, but I have uh, a large number of writing commitments that I've been involved with. I have two novels that are just about completed, have to be finished. I do a lot of writing for other sources. But most important of all, uh, my film, which was on, uh, uh, let's see, PBS December 23rd past, uh, has uh, just been nominated for a National Critics Circle Award nomination, which is a highly prestigious thing. And uh, as a result, I've gotten all kinds of writing uh, offers and performing offers in television. And I've I felt for a long time that, as a performer primarily, I I just uh, I, I just didn't have time any longer to do radio. <laughs> and this is not a put down of radio, but I think I've done enough of it. I've paid my dues in it. And uh, as a performer, I guess most of the radio listeners tend to think of me as a radio performer. This is not so. Uh, in fact, uh, even when I came to the station, I came to the station, you may remember, Tony, when I came to the station, I was doing a Broadway play, Broadway show, uh, New Faces, if you recall. And I've done several Broadway shows subsequent to that time uh, and after that time. And uh, I've been doing maybe 40 to 50 college performances around the country. In fact, the most recent one, I just came back from uh, Colorado, where I did a show in Denver. And uh, I'm about to do one, incidentally, for those of you who would like to see this year's big show. The next big show I'm going to do live, and I know that there's going to be letters about it, so I might as well put it on right now, will be the big show that we do every year at Princeton during the uh, their big reunion week. It's a fantastic show. I mean, not necessarily my show, but the whole panoply of the of the week over there, uh, the reunion week, and I perform every year. This is now my, I think, tenth straight performance, uh, annual performance at Alexander Hall in Princeton, and it'll be Friday, the third of June at eight p.m. Got it? Friday, June third, and uh, the way to get tickets, if, because this thing is always sold, it's been sold out every year for ten years now. And so you better get on the stick right now. Call them. This is a benefit we do every year for WPRB, which is the Princeton radio station, uh, in case you're interested in what it's, why it's done. That's what it's done for. And it's area 609 uh, to call, 452-3655. I repeat, it's area 609-452-3655. Now, I've, uh, I've always enjoyed being here at WOR and being on, you know, doing the radio show every night. Tremendous enjoyment. Yet, on the other hand, uh, uh, the press of time, you just have so much time at your disposal. And a performer, of course, is not like uh, other people. He, uh, I'm not a radio person, really, and, and a radio person, of course, devotes time to his radio thing. That's what he does. Uh, but in my case, I'm a performer, which means that I've been doing television. I have a TV show now that's on uh, public television. Maybe some of you have seen it over in Jersey, and it's a lot of work. Uh, I have, a, a, an incidentally, a network special that I've just been contacted about and I'm about to do on one of the major networks for the Raytheon Corporation. And uh, it's just too much time. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to continue to do it, but I can't, and uh, that's so much for that. I've enjoyed doing it, though, and for those of you who've enjoyed it, I'm glad you have. But uh, the uh, it's just like the Mary Tyler Moore show. 
really. It's very much the same thing. See, I think I think that that uh, this is often confused. Uh, I guess maybe perhaps because radio seems to many people to not be show business. And uh, it, it is true that many people in radio really aren't in show business. They're really primarily in advertising. <laughs> They're in the record business, whatever it might be. But I'm in show business. And, and uh, when you're in show business as a performer and as a writer, uh, there's a time when you simply have to move on to other projects due to the press of time. And I'm sure this is... In fact, I know this is what's happened in the case of Mary Tyler Moore. The real reason that... Uh, Many people within the Mary Tyler Moore organization will tell you is that they they want to move on to other projects, and the uh, the continuing doing of the Mary Tyler Moore show has taken too much of their time. Uh, they've already done it; it's been a success, and uh, that's as far as they want to go with it. Now they're moving on, and that's the way I feel about what I'm doing. Uh, I'm uh, you know I'm I'm delighted with uh, with my newfound extra time, which I've immediately been taken up, but <laughs> so. Uh, I, uh, I I just want to assure you that it wasn't the station being, uh, you know, uh, instrumental in this because uh, this has been ongoing for about two years in my case. What happened with the other people on the station, I have no idea. I have no contact with them, nor do I know anything about it. Uh, but my case, what happened with me, has nothing whatsoever to do with the others. And uh, I wish them well. But uh, in my case, uh, it was on my volition, and uh, it was a long-considered decision. One which, incidentally, I, I think uh, there have been several uh, views of it. Uh, my agents, for example, who happened to be William Morris, uh, were after me to, to leave radio as long ago as ten years ago, five years ago. I said, this is ridiculous, you know. Uh, not that they put radio down, but... It just seemed that uh, there were many other projects, which I could not do because of radio, due to contractual commitments for one thing, and also due to the fact of time, again, the old evil time. When you're doing five radio shows a week, five nights a week, 45 minutes a night, and, and coming up with original material for the most part every night, this requires an ex extraordinary amount of time. For those of you who don't know this, you may you may think, well, he comes on the air, he only puts in 45 minutes. <laughs> well, uh, try writing 45 minutes of original comedy material. And uh, every day, it's a, it's a lot of time. It's uh, it takes a lot of effort and work, and it's it's very tiring. And I and I'm delighted to be free. And uh, I I just hope though that uh, you will continue to listen to the station and enjoy the station. And uh, and uh, you'll have plenty of chances to hear my work and see my work, primarily uh, television, because I'm not going to uh, my my uh, my radio show. If for those of you who don't know, this is also syndicated around the country, but that will continue. But. Uh, as far as uh, doing five nights a week radio on uh, live, mostly here at the station, that just can't be done anymore. Can't be done any longer for me. Uh, first of all, it's it's travel. I don't really know much about how how difficult it is to travel uh, around the country and what time it takes. Uh, if if uh, for example, I did a show in Colorado here couple of days ago, a week ago or so, and uh, due to the kind of airline commitments that were involved, I had to spend roughly four days to do a one-evening show. <laughs> four days en route, back and forth, and, and being at the hotel and one thing and another, and uh, it's, the, it's the life on the road that ultimately wears you down. Like this weekend, I'm traveling to Washington to do a show in Virginia, and uh, I'll be traveling around, uh, doing shows around the country. And, of course, the big Princeton show coming up. And then there's going to be one out in, uh, uh, I believe it's, what's it called, Clinton? Uh, yeah, but th that's not the place. That's the town. Well, I'll find out about it. It's, uh, it's a big show, a big performance. I think it's in July, isn't it, sometime like that? So uh, <laughs> the Clinton Barn, the, the, the Clinton Memorial Park, is it a memorial? What's it a memorial to? Uh, the floods of Jersey, maybe, huh? Oh, it's the Clinton Historical Museum Park. 
Okay, that's going to be in July. They haven't announced the date yet, so I'll be over there. <laughs> I'll be doing many things. But uh, all in all, it's been a wonderful uh, association. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, uh, Tony Galano, who is working with me now, was the engineer on the first show that I did here. He's here, he's here tonight, and uh, he's doing the show. And it was the first show, which was it came from the studio right across the hall over there. And uh, he worked with me on that one, and he's worked endless shows with me since. And it's always been a great uh, pleasure to work with him. In fact, I've enjoyed working with everybody here at the station. Uh, only in the very early days of the of the station, they had a couple of guys who went bananas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it was wonderful. You know, some of the people who've been through this station, you may not know some of the guys that, that, that have, you know, went on to other things in show business were involved. I guess most people in America are not used to really a performer or a person in, the, in, in media being involved in various forms of media. Most people, you know, they're not, they really stick to what they do. Uh, uh, John Gambling, he does radio. He, he, you, you just can't imagine John doing a film uh, or, uh, you know, doing a tap dance. Or uh, playing uh, playing uh, Humphrey Bogart's double in a stage play, but in my case, uh, I, I never was a radio man, and I never considered myself that. And uh, for that reason, it's been a fascinating, uh, you know, experience for me to, to be around radio stations and not not really be part of them, and yet to be an observer of them. Fascinating places, and uh, it's an intriguing uh, medium, medium. Excuse me. Uh, although radio has become media, really, basically. There's about 15 different types of uh, radio. But uh, I hope, uh, I seriously hope, though, that uh, that you will, uh, you know, will understand. I, I, the reason I'm saying a lot of this, it may seem redundant to many of you, but listeners tend to always believe that there is an evil ogre at every radio station that fires the good guys. <laughs> they really believe that. It's just not true in this case. And, uh, and I frankly uh, uh, I frankly feel that it's unfair to say that to them. I, I know that a lot of people have written this kind of stuff, and I've gotten copies of letters they've sent. And I appreciate it, but it's not true. So, is it time for a station break yet? No? Well, I'm going to do one anyway. Uh, this is WOR New York. I'm getting very independent there in my last few shows. I'll be here, by the way, until April the 1st. This is not my last show, so don't, uh, don't pack it in. And neither is it our last show, but uh, I just need to remind you that this is WBAI in New York, 99.5 FM. And now back to Gene Shepard. I'll be here till the 1st of April. And uh, among other things, we'll be doing such uh, deathless commercials as the following one. Here we go. Lafayette introduces a stereo component system that breaks all the rules. Rule 1. Good quality component systems cost over $300. Lafayette's new stereo component system costs only $198. Rule 2. When you pay so little, you get a lot of little names. Nonsense. The receiver is the Lafayette LR1515 AM-FM stereo receiver with impressive power, FM multiplex circuitry, and more. The speakers are Lafayette Criterion 26s. The turntable is the Garrard 440 with bass, dust cover, and pickering cartridge. Rule 3. Inexpensive sound systems sound inexpensive. If you add the individual component prices, this $198 system would cost $350, which makes it an inexpensive, expensive system. Lafayette's $198 stereo component system. It breaks all the rules except one, which is you can keep something on sale for just so long. Sale ends Wednesday at your nearest Lafayette store. And, uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know all about it. Don't worry, I've done these things before, these radio shows. And now a reminder that the next time you buy tea, make it white rose tea. According to this thing here, white rose tea bags are priced to suit your budget. I mean, you never think in terms of a budget connecting itself with a tea bag, particularly when compared to the big national brands or coffee. Listen, I understand there's a, an outfit, uh, One, I know one guy now that has put two sealed one-pound cans of coffee in his will. He's leaving them to us. Uh, <laughs> but it's when you get all but prepare your first cup that you'll really appreciate superb white rose tea. It's a mixture of uh, imported orange peco. It's not pronounced pico, you know. It's peco. 
uh, and cut black teas, especially blended, to appeal to families in the New York area. Same people that say Pico also say, I just had one of them egg crepes. I want them chicken crepes. <laughs> you, uh, what do you mean? You, you think you, you, <laughs> anyway, when you're picking up your white rose tea bags, bring home a bottle of white rose ready tea, liquid iced tea concentrate. You just pour, uh, let's see, one ounce of concentrate in a glass, add ice, cold water, and stir, and you got great iced tea. Where is it available? Well, White Rose is available at Acme, Grand Union, and Finest Supermarkets. Hey, now you can get all the news at half the price. Uh, that's right. The Long Island Press gives you total news coverage. In-depth local news, national, international, plus a dynamic lineup of features and columnists for only a dime. The Long Island Press has held the line against inflation by holding its cost at 10 cents, and that's at least half the price you'd have to pay for any competing afternoon paper. So keep totally informed and save up to $33 in 1977. Order the Long Island Press now. Get the best bargain on Long Island. It's the Long Island Press. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, here's our old friend Chucky here. <laughs> Showbiz Chucky singing it out. We've oh, yeah. got decorated <laughs> bumper lighting to turn to lower. We've got tiles and bones. He's so cute there in those tinfoil shoes. His mother Rollers, just loves it. Crackles, walls, covering till you'll faint. Gardens, <laughs> home decorating sanders. It, it ain't just, just paint. Use this weekend to catch up with some of your home paint jobs. Fix up projects, etc. Save on multi guard flat wall paint. Now three ninety nine a gallon. All enterprise latex flat and semi gloss interior wall paints. Prices now roll back to nineteen seventy two prices, and those were good ones. Yes, sir. Go down to Martin's and lash out to some of these great paint values and sing it out with a little old Chucky here. We've got decorated lumber lighting fixtures galore. We've got tiles and bulbs and brushes. We've got covering for the floor. Rollers, paints, and spackles, balls, covering till you faint. Martin's home decorating centers. It ain't just paint. Okay, no more commercials. Uh, you can come back up uh, from out from under the day bed now. Uh, <laughs> it'll be all right. <laughs> Hey, you know, uh, I, I have a few more things I have to say about uh, the, uh, you know, leaving. Uh, as a storyteller, I'm, and that is my profession as a professional storyteller and entertainer on stage and in writing and and uh, and in any medium that I, I choose to use at any given time, uh, the one uh, thing I I must say about radio and... Uh, and uh, this may answer a few questions for you. Even though I enjoy doing it, many people have enjoyed it uh, from the letters and the countless uh, stuff that we've heard from from listeners and so on over the years. Radio is best described by was best described by Fred Allen uh, in his book. Uh, he, he described it a treadmill to oblivion, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what he meant by this, of course, doesn't mean that radio isn't a good medium or anything like that. What he does mean, though, is radio is one of those mediums uh, that uses up a vast amount of material, a great amount of your work and the effort. Uh, every bit as much work goes into producing a good, funny radio show as in, say, doing a good, funny nightclub show. And I've done both. Uh, but the problem with radio is that it's voracious. Uh, it... Uh, Radio listeners are not like nightclub listeners, viewers, whatever you call a nightclub goer. A nightclub goer, for example, uh, and I've played many clubs, and, and uh, you find it in a nightclub, they love for you to tell the same story again. In fact, uh, a friend of mine, Bob Newhart, mentioned the fact that he often got tired of telling the same story, uh, you know, the same submarine story all the time. He says he got so he hated the idea, <laughs> he hated doing it. But the, but the fans in the nightclubs insisted that he do this. Uh, everywhere he went, he has to do it. It's like Judy Garland always had to sing over the rainbow. And at the, you know, her last years of her life, uh, I understand she'd even break out in a rash when she even saw a rainbow. So, but, but radio listeners are very different. Uh, radio listeners demand constant, uh, constant change. They demand, uh, if I tell a story uh, in 19, uh, say, 68... 
and uh, and I retell it in 1977, I'm sure to get three letters from some guy that says, Oh, you're running out of material, you bum! I... <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, radio, and and it's a th it's a thankless medium largely for a performer. Now, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you about that too, in that uh, thankless in the sense that uh, that uh, you rarely have ever read in a newspaper. How long has it been in a newspaper? Have you read a review of a radio show? Unless it happens to be a very official show done by an official public service uh, FM station about uh, the departure of a U.N. delegation from <laughs> that kind of stuff. But radio is not really recognized critically, uh, and, and this is important to a performer. Uh, it, it ultimately is crucial in your career. Now, I'll give you an idea of the difference in mediums. Uh, I just did uh, my play uh, that was done on the, on the PBS network, December 23rd, The Phantom of the Open Hearth. Well... That uh, has not only received uh, critical uh, acclaim, but, but I mean, it's been reviewed all over the country by thousands of newspapers. But in addition to that, it's just been awarded a major award, or at least it's nominated for a major award, the Critic Circle Award. And by the way, you can see this show. Uh, the Critic Circle Award is going to be televised from Hollywood uh, April the 11th, and I will be there, so you'll see me squatting at one of the tables with... Uh, with uh, Mia Farrow or somebody looking uh, looking nervous when they're opening the envelopes. But Phantom of the Open Hearth has been nominated in three categories for a major award. One, the best comedy program of 1976. Uh, the best comedy writing of 1976. And the third category is the best comedy performance by uh, the actor who played uh, the father in it, uh, James Broderick. So uh, we'll see, you know. But it, I'm just, this is an example uh, of uh, what happens in other mediums. If you if you uh, write a short story, as I have written many many short stories here for Playboy, they're reprinted and they appear in uh, anthologies and textbooks over the years and so on. But radio shows uh, they're they're by, they're about like making a, uh, a a statue out of snow. You know, uh, it's a great statue, and everybody comes and looks at it for 15 minutes, and then it disappears. And uh, although many of my radio shows that I've done in the past still remain on tape, uh, they're only heard by comparatively few. They're they're in a tape machine, and they're 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 recorded for quote posterity, but they're not a living form, like say a painting would be seen by generations of people seeing a painting coming to a museum uh, or. A piece of music would be played endlessly. Uh, uh, you know, many, many composers, uh, their works are played uh, hundreds of years after they're dead. Uh, this is also true of films. You, you turn your television set on and you'll see actors. Often, one night I remember sitting with a, with a, with a famous film, uh, a famous film actor, who, by the way, is up now for an Academy Award, this particular actor, is a friend of mine. And we were watching a film that he had done many years ago when he was new in his career. And uh, we were in this apartment. There were other people around and watching this thing. And he mentioned, he mentioned just in passing that there wasn't a single member of the cast, and including the director and the producer, who was still alive. But yet, here was the film playing, <laughs> which says something about that medium. In other words, uh, an artist likes to have his work last a bit. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't like it to just be uh, something that uh, disappears overnight. And uh, you take you take uh, people like uh, Fred Allen, who devoted his life to being funny on the radio. There are just a few little tape recordings or little discs of his whole lifetime of work available. And this is a shame. I really feel. And uh, and it's one it's one of the great uh, weaknesses of this medium for as an artistic medium, as an, as a medium of uh, information, as a medium of news. As a medium of listening to music, it's unsurpassed. But as a, as a medium for a, an artist, a performer, an entertainer, a humorist to work in, uh, I've been doing it for years myself as a hobby because I enjoy doing it, but not because it's an important part of my career. It never, it just uh, simply isn't. And uh, I've, as much as I've enjoyed it. So this probably may explain to some of you more, uh, possibly, the reasons that I've made my decisions. 
Now, an example now, I'll be playing Princeton here this, uh, this June coming up. Now, uh, on stage, you see, I've always felt, too, that the problem, uh, every medium has its, uh, its weaknesses, or its, its, let's put it this way, Tony, every medium has its limitations, not weaknesses, but limitations. So, what you can do on the radio as a performer is obviously something you can't do in a nightclub. To begin with, uh, here's an example. Uh, a nightclub, how many people are in a club at any given time? Possibly, uh, at the most, a couple of hundred. In the, in, in a, that's a very successful club. Uh, and that's how many people are going to see what you do. In addition to that, drinks are being served, and the, you're, you're competing with the guy that's just ordered the pizza. Uh, you're competing with the guy in the back that's having a fight with his wife. By the way, this did happen to me one night. I'll tell you a story about that. About in the middle of a, of a bit I was doing in a nightclub, a place called Down in the Depths. When I came to New York, I was doing a clock club work. It was in the Hotel Duane on uh, Madison Avenue. And it was a very chic club, incidentally, other, among people who played there. And, I, and I'd like to salute him right now, by the way, uh, a friend of mine who has just died, Milt Kamen. Milt was a, was an old, old friend of mine and a very, very nice man. And uh, Milt never, I, I, I always felt that Milt never achieved the fame that he deserved. And I'll tell you why, primarily. Milt really was a nice guy. Nice guys rarely finish first in this business. And uh, <laughs> Milt's stuff was, was ceaselessly stolen from it by other performers. And I've had that problem many times. And this is one of the reasons why I went out of, out of radio, really. I want to use my material for my own work and purposes. But uh, anyway, I'd just like to salute Milt. Uh, he passed on uh, not long ago, and he was a wonderful guy. Milt and I used to sit down at the Rikers on 57th Street and spend hours uh, working out gags. And, and anyway, we worked together down at the Duane Hotel, uh, and it was a, a nightclub. And uh, among other people that were at that club, in fact, simultaneously was Mike and uh, Mike and Elaine were there, and uh, good people. And it was a good club, and it was a good place to work. And uh, I remember one night Milt advising me down at the club. He says, "You know, your radio. He says you shouldn't be messing with this medium. He said because uh, people will will think of you as a disc jockey or something and don't play records." And uh, and uh, in ways he was right, but on the other hand, I don't I don't regret having been on the air all this time. I've enjoyed it immensely. But uh, getting back to the club that night, I remember doing this show that in this club, and in the middle of this bit, the place was packed. And this is the kind of thing you run into in clubs. It was really packed. There must have been. It was a very chic club. It was a kind of club. It's a true cellar. Have you heard of clubs described as a cellar? Well, this was a cellar. <laughs> and it had been a cellar. They they took the cellar at this hotel and made it into this club. And you came downstairs and it was a cellar. If you stood on your tiptoes, even if you were five feet four, your head would hit the ceiling. And it was dark, but very elegant. And, you know, one of the places, a $25 minimum. Uh, and, and so one night in the middle of my a bit I was doing and the audience was laughing and it was very silent at this moment. I was playing this dramatic little bit. Suddenly this voice in the back hollered, I've had enough of this, you dumb broad. And I hear this crash. <laughs> he gave her a shove. And at that point she was wearing these, these white furs. This, this woman had these white furs. He had this great big piled up Dolly Parton hairdo. You know, it must have taken her three or four weeks just to do the hair. She, he, he gave her a shove, and I could see in the background there, at that point, she, she reaches down and she grabbed what looked like a, a bowl of rice pudding and slapped it right in his face, you know, just like the thing you see with the soupy sails, you know, right in the face. And, and at that point, the club is in an uproar and the people are cheering. And, of course, forget your act. <laughs> I mean, the act was down the window. This was really... And the, there were two very p prominent social people, by the way, that were going on with this scene. So this is the kind of stuff that happens to you in clubs. I remember one night, by the way, speaking of, of uh, wild things that happened in clubs, I was doing this bit and the crowd was cheering and everything else. And uh, I was working like crazy. When all of a sudden I see this figure come to my right and this guy... He just, it was a, short, a low stage. It was only about a foot and a half, two feet high stage. All of a sudden, this guy stops in front, right in front of me, and I'm doing this bit. All, he's right in front of everybody. He hits me on a foot, see? And I look down, and, and I said, yes. He says, where, uh, where can I get a drink? 
I says, well, why don't you ask one of the waiters? He says, well, aren't you a waiter? <laughs> now, that doesn't happen in radio. Uh, it is true that occasionally uh, you'll be interrupted by 452 commercials, uh, but you can control those somewhat. So that's the limitation of the club. The club limitation is always battling the customer. And, and people who work clubs ultimately learn to hate it. The limitation of... Uh, now, my favorite medium, and when it comes to actually favorite mediums, is live on stage. To, to me, and I don't mean in a club. Club is another world. I'm talking about the concert stage. Carnegie Hall, I've played four Carnegie Hall shows. The college shows, like the coming up show at Princeton. Uh, the shows that I do in colleges, and which I'm going to expand vastly now that I'm uh, free of this nightly... Uh, uh, responsibility here. However, uh, every medium has its limitations and its positiveness. Now, the positiveness, of course, of radio is that uh, millions of people listen to you on uh, in areas where they could conceivably get any other kind of thing, like in a car. You're driving along. This is the great area for radio today. Uh, the car. Uh, the, the radio and the john. Uh, nobody watches television while he's taking a shower, but yet most people actually listen to the radio while they're taking a shower. So radio has its uh, it has its good features, although they're not the same as they used to be. I must add, uh, radio used to be a medium uh, where uh, all kinds of interesting things happened. Now it's gotten to be formula: the interview show, uh, the call-in show. Uh, the middle of the road music show. In short, there's no there's no such thing as a as a as a variegated uh, radio format. So that's uh, that's radio. The limitations of film. Now, it's interesting about film. There are many limitations to film. First of all, film is not a personal medium. Not at all like say, uh, well, the film that we did for uh, PBS. Many people watching uh, uh, the Phantom of the Open Heart probably felt they were the only person watching it. They, they had this feeling of personal involvement, which you can't get in a movie house. You go in the movie house, you see all these other yucks sitting around or eating popcorn. And uh, it's, a, it's an impersonal medium. The, uh, that is the theater, theatrical film. And yet, the advantage of a theatrical film, this is one of the great advantages, is the great control over the medium that the creators of the medium have. In other words, there's no such thing as a sponsor of a film. Uh, you, you don't find uh, uh, that uh, you have to. You don't have to worry about FCC regulations and all the other things when you're making a film for the movie house. And also, there's one very big plus in the movie world, and that is worldwide distribution. In short, you do a film, and that film will be seen in London. Uh, not true of television shows. Johnny Carson is unknown in Holland. <laughs> it may surprise you. <laughs> we can't. We can't believe it. You know, uh, we, we 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 tend to think that these things must be universal. People uh, sitting out there in the, in the Uganda are watching uh, Mary Tyler Moore. Not so. This is an American TV show, and uh, it, it's very definitely limited uh, in its in its scope. A rare film, very very rare shows are often shown over there. Mostly crime shows, oddly enough, are shown in foreign countries. Kojak and so on. Uh, yeah, that's true. I was in England recently, and there was Kojak, big as life and twice as bald. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, every medium has its uh, has its positives and its negatives. And I've worked in all of them. I'm not talking here theoretically. And I'm talking about working professionally in all of them. Uh, the Broadway stage, which I have uh, worked in, and I've worked in legit theater, that has many problems these days. And uh, most of them are economic. And they can't be surmounted in that uh, it's almost prohibitively uh, impossible to do a Broadway show of any consequence these days without running the risk of absolutely lo losing your total shirt. Because it's the only show, it's the only kind of thing where you can spend two years, I'm talking about Broadway, so you can spend two years of your work and uh, probably a half million dollars of monies 
and it all goes down the drain in one night. <laughs> That's not true. You could even turn out if you turn out a turkey in a mo- of a movie, you'll uh, you'll eventually get your money back. It'll be on the second or the third notch on a double bill playing in drive-ins in the porny houses. But nevertheless, it's not that nearly as risky. So there's a big difference. Plus the fact that the Broadway house has been taken over largely by women's clubs uh, who buy tickets and they want to see musicals. And so that's probably endlessly what you'll see on Broadway. Now, I've played off-Broadway. I've been involved in the off-Broadway movement and did many off-Broadway plays at one point in my career. And that, of course, also was an economic problem uh, when the village became a great... uh, area for uh, tourists, uh, the, rent is, the rentals went way up in the buildings down there, so it's no longer possible, you know, the old romantic idea of let's put this play on for a shoestring, you better have a platinum tipped gold shoestring about four miles long before you decide to put that play on that shoestring, so that's really the, the problem with that medium, and uh, so that leaves uh, uh, really it, uh, up to the performer and the, the writer to work in the various mediums that he cares to. I, I, the most satisfaction I've ever had, really, as, a, as a, I suppose as a, as a performer, writer, and so on, have been in my novels, really. Uh, in God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories, The Ferrari in the Bedroom. Uh, these three... Uh, and they're only the beginning of more to come, by the way. These three have provided me with a great deal of satisfaction, and, and it's kind of nice to see your work in libraries and to know that uh, they're still all in print and doing very well. It's a great feeling. It's not the economic thing. You know, most people tend to think of economics as the reason you do things, and maybe that's why you do things. If it is, I feel sorry for you. It's the satisfaction of knowing that your work uh, is appreciated or read or widely disseminated and and uh, you feel a certain genuine solid sense of achievement radio on the other hand i've long since begun not to feel that uh because it is such a temporary medium it is such a uh, such a transitory medium and, and that incidentally is one of its strengths the mere fact that i'm here and uh and it's, it's only going to be heard this moment, gives it a certain, uh, I don't want to use the word preciousness, but it gives it a certain urgency. Uh, and for that reason, it's a one-to-one medium. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny about radio, too. Most people who listen to a radio show, particularly a show like mine, tend to think they're the only ones listening. <laughs> and they really do. <laughs> and nothing could be further from the truth, actually. Radio has a vast audience these days, and uh, millions and millions of radios are tuned on at any given time. And probably in the history of radio, there's never been greater listenership than there is right now. But radio, like very every, almost to the last medium, is suffering from the same problem that many other businesses are suffering from today, and that's the economic problem, always. But uh, well, yeah, I've enjoyed it. And I hope uh, you understand now some of the reasons that went into my making the decision to finally leave a nightly radio show. Doesn't mean I'm going to entirely leave radio. I'm going to continue to have my my uh, syndicated show around the country, but that's a whole different thing. They're recorded, and that's a, an entirely different process. But uh, I hope to see you at Princeton, June 3rd, Friday, at Alexander Hall at 8 p.m., and if you want to call about a ticket, you call them at 452-3655. And I'll be here till April 1st, so I'm not leaving tonight. One other thing, mark on your calendar April 11th. That's the night they're going to broadcast the Critic Circle from Hollywood Awards. It's a kind of like a, a new type Emmy. It's, a, it's, it's really an award given by the critics of America, which I consider a good one. And we've been nominated, so I'll be there with bells on. But uh, so it is. And uh, you notice that, uh, that even when you're leaving, this is the difference of a medium, even when you're leaving uh, a radio show after, you know, a number of years doing it, it's not greeted with the same applause and hoopla as, say, Mary Tyler Moore leaving. <laughs> well, again, the difference in the medium, because they promote themselves. Uh, and uh, it, it's always thus. But... Uh, it's a great, it's a great thing. I think uh, we're we're a, we're a media people, uh, America, and for better or for ill, I I, I don't I don't uh, 
I don't think it's an entirely a good thing that so many people rely on uh, radio and television and the, and uh, movies for life. Many people read to them, this is life. Really. <laughs> they have little, and, and it's kind of tragic. Maybe, though, inevitable. So uh, I, I bet a lot of people, when Mary Tyler Moore left the air, felt like one of their best friends had disappeared from their lives. That's truly sad. <laughs> it really is. And, uh, and I'm sure the same thing will happen with my show to many people. But, uh, you know, think clean thoughts. Uh, hang. Uh, what was it Bob and Ray used to say? Hang by your thumbs, and if you find work, let us know. <laughs> I wonder where they are. That was a great performance. But uh, I'm looking forward with vast interest to this big TV special we're going to do and, and uh, many other things. So uh, it's between you and me and your cheap little Japanese transistor radio. It's that eternal triangle. And there's always one that has to be in their kitchen. The other woman, probably. The other woman, in this case, is the lure, the siren lure of films and television and novels. Oh, yes. And this is WOR New York, of course. Oh, this is WBAI in New York. That was Gene Shepard's farewell to radio. Uh, about a week before his final broadcast, uh, March 23rd, 1977.